Okay. Good. So, um, I'm Matt, and this is Lindsay, and we're the learning innovation team from uh, Learning Pool, and we're here today to talk about the new landscape of learning design. So, this is kind of started off by, I'm sure you have all heard the, the kind of marketing spiel going on at the moment about, oh, LXPs are the Netflix of learning. Yeah, so you're hearing that bandied about quite a bit, the Netflix of learning. And it can become a bit tiresome and you go, is that comparison really accurate? I think it is a fairly good comparison for the UI of what an LXP is going to be and all of that stuff. But importantly, I think it's going to change the way that our content behaves because that's the thing we don't think about, the effect that Netflix and similar platforms had on television and the content that they host. And I think the same is going to be true of learning. So if we have a look like um, a, a traditional TV show that you get on terrestrial television back in the 90s, Seinfeld, if you look at kind of the length of each episode of that, it is a very straight line on that chart there. Everything is exactly the same. It has to be kind of squeezed into that slot on TV between several advert breaks um, so that everything runs smoothly. Whereas if you look on this side, take a show like Stranger Things on Netflix, and every episode is a different length. And that's because it's just made to be the right length for the story of that show. So kind of the length adapts to what the creator needs rather than the other way around. Um, and that means that the line between film and TV is becoming kind of blurred, like format and these labels of what types of content things are don't matter as much anymore. And the same is true of um, Bandersnatch. Don't know if any of you, I don't know whether you say you watched it or you played it. That's the weird thing. Like, it's a TV show slash a film with interactive elements, which Netflix debuted this year. Um, and it's starting to just not matter um, what the format is, or what elements you're using, storytelling is the objective, and it doesn't matter what you use to get there. And again, I think we're going to see the same thing when it comes to uh, our learning design with LXPs. Uh, so learning can be the length that it needs to be, it's unconstrained by format, and we just use the techniques and features it requires. Because everything's kind of so seamless and easy to launch, uh, you can almost treat the features as modular bits that you swap in and out. So instead of going, oh, this is going to be a storyline course, so I'm going to build it in storyline, and it's going to be half an hour long, you can go, well, I quite like to have a video at the start, so I'm just going to put a video in the LXP, and then I probably want a bit of a, like a reflective bit afterwards, so I'll put a little adapt module with an open text input in it, and then maybe some questions built in another platform. But it doesn't matter what you've got, you just string them together and achieve the learning outcomes you want instead of going, yeah, oh, well, it's an LMS, so I've got to upload this, and it's probably going to be half an hour long and all of that kind of stuff. And then you kind of think about the style of the content itself. If you look at terrestrial TV, it still comparatively has to play it safe you um, kind of have to have fairly traditional standards with the topics it covers uh, and the style that it's in. Uh, but cable TV and online platforms kind of allow you to have more niche content and perhaps more taboo subjects. You can be a bit more out there. And in a similar way, music platforms like Spotify have allowed um, musicians to kind of make a whole variety of new genres and combinations of genres that reach far smaller audiences that before would have been too disparate to kind of get to. Um, and I don't know how many of you uh, are kind of involved in learning design itself, but we've all had that thing where you get a spec through and it goes, right, so you've got to make this module, but it's got to be appropriate to everyone in every office across the eight countries that we operate across all the different cultures that that covers and all the different departments that covers, and you just end up kind of making something really generic. You lose everything kind of quirky or interesting about the piece of learning that you're making, and you end up with something kind of bland and lifeless, which I consider to be the one show of learning. 
it's kind of a completely unfulfilling um, process for the learning designer and the learner alike. Um, but, so for example, um, with our LXP, we've been thinking about targeting content at specific users um, and making that a bit more, uh, as it's more personalized, it can be a bit more uh, esoteric in its nature. Um, for example, we, um, I'm currently working on a campaign about single-use plastics and how we can reduce the use of them. Uh, but if you just just a single office, maybe just take this audience, it's going to be very difficult to make a module that addresses all of you because there's going to be some people who are just like, yeah, great, I agree. It's obviously an issue. How do I just get on with reducing my use of single-use plastics? They need one kind of approach. Then you're going to have the skeptical people who are like, well, I don't really think that one person deciding not to buy bananas wrapped in plastic is going to make any difference to the environment. Why waste my time on this? And then you probably have a third group who just uh, don't know anything about this yet. Now, if you try and make one course or one module that addresses all of those people, you're going to turn everyone off. There's not going to be enough of getting straight to it for the people who want to make a difference. The skeptical people are going to think, oh, well, this is even more of a waste of my time when I could be working. And the uninformed people are just going to be like, what? what? What's this? Um, so our campaign is designed to constantly assess your opinion and where you're at and what you want to do so that you get the content that you need. So if we kind of open it up with a few questions and those questions indicate that, yeah, you're on board already. There's no point preaching to the choir. We're going to push you straight into that green bit there, concerned, and you're going to get a load of content that's directed at you. Um, if you start out cynical, the idea is that you'll go through kind of a pathway of content that addresses your cynicism, reassesses where you're at with it, and then hopefully you get to the point where you're concerned, so you'll be pushed over into that content. So, yeah. It's meant to be a far more personalized and therefore a lot more effective approach to learning design. So this is an example of one of those pieces which I'm quite fond of, um, which is for the cynical learners. It's a piece uh, that one of our learning designers came up with called Laminate the Earth, where um, you're kind of convinced by a shady individual to do your very best to cover the earth in plastic. And it's very tongue-in-cheek and it's quite silly, but it kind of... Um, takes a very different view, which is designed specifically to not be patronizing and actually address the cynicism that you might have and give proper answers to it. Um, and hopefully it's a bit fun as well, because there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but such, yeah, such a strange, esoteric piece of learning would never exist in that kind of one-size-fits-all mentality that we've all got quite used to. And of course, to tailor that content to specific people, you need to be able to measure that stuff and track it at a very granular level, all that stuff about how they're feeling about it and what their answers were and all that kind of thing. Um, I was kind of researching the old way of doing this, how people track television viewers, because you see things, it's like a million people tuned into this. And I was like, how are they working that out? Like, are they watching all of our TVs? Because that can't be true. Uh, and it turns out they get 12,000 people across only 5,100 homes across the UK, and that's meant to be like uh, represent the viewing population of the UK, which is 66 million people, which means that they've got a sample size that's only 0.018% of the population. That's got to be vague at best. Um, and then I kind of thought about... Oh, I thought about going to the wrong slide. Let's go back. I thought about other online platforms and the way they can measure that. If you're on YouTube, all the creators on there who are getting millions and millions of views, it's a lot more of a precise science. Those platforms, modern platforms, they know kind of how many times you watched it, whether you come back again, where you came from to watch it. Using kind of ad profiling and cookies, they probably know your age, your gender, your other interests. They will know everything about their viewers. And with that information, they can tailor their new content to it. They can kind of constantly adapt in a way that, in learning design, I don't know about you, but 
I've felt sometimes the horizon of the landscape of learning design has just been a, a brick wall, kind of a maker course that goes out there and beyond kind of happy sheets and a little bit of user testing, I don't really get much back about who's using it, how they're using it, what they liked, what they struggled with. And I feel like we can, with these new, new kind of LXP platforms, with XAPI, where you can see absolutely everything, like, oh, everyone failed on question three. Why is that? Is it because I've written it badly? Is it because the content preceding it isn't good enough? I'll change it right now, and I'll find out, and my learning will get better. Which is kind of like, you know, tech teams say a lot, fail fast. It's like, yeah, fail fast is a good idea so you can improve. But I can't fail fast if I don't know that I'm failing in the first place. Which is a bit of a strange message. I didn't, I didn't expect to be standing up here and saying, what's really great about new learning design is that we will be able to fail. But we will, and that is a good thing. Um, and then I kind of went down a bit of a rabbit hole thinking about this again. Um, about one of the big things about YouTube and the like, the platforms that the media are using that we should be starting to emulate, um, is the user-generated side of it, which can result in some crazy things, because now anyone can upload anything to the internet. Everyone can create things. My favorite example being, there is a man known as Filthy Frank, who is known for making these horrific videos that are quite disturbing and disgusting at times. He started a dance craze that was just him dancing on this YouTube video that got millions of hits. End up with the then presidential candidate Hillary Clinton emulating that dance and posting it on YouTube herself. Now that's a bit of a tangent, but I think it kind of says something about the power of um, having anyone in the world or in your organization being able to generate um, learning content because there's a lot of untapped potential that could have a huge effect on the way your organization's running if you could just enable people to make this stuff and upload it. And all of us, and all of you, the people in your organization will have a smartphone in their pocket that has the ability to film, edit, and upload all just on that one device, which I think is going to massively change the landscape of our learning. Um, yeah, and uh, of course, you see that with YouTube and other platforms where people are uploading their own tutorial videos, and it is all a lot of learning content. I probably spend half my time learning on the job, looking at YouTube videos of how to do it. I think it's really exciting that we're gonna be able to kind of pull that in-house and have it on a platform. And I'm just excited. I feel like I'm a preacher now. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm gonna hand over to Lindsay now, who's going to talk about the more practical sides of those things. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. So um, we started talking at the beginning about the similarities with Netflix and the fact that a lot of people are talking about their platforms being the Netflix of learning. Um, there is some truth in that. Uh, we want our platforms to be places that people want to go to. We want them to be easy to access. We want them to be easy to find information on. Um, but actually, what we want is fundamentally different to um, what Netflix wants. So Netflix would like you, ideally, 24 hours a day, sit on your sofa and watch box sets. That would be great for them, as long, especially if you keep paying them every month. If they could charge you more for the more you paid, they'd probably think that was even better. Um, as a learning platform, actually, what we want is almost the complete opposite of that. If we're doing our job properly, we want engagement, we want people to go there, but we probably want them to spend as little time as possible to get what they need, get out and get on with their job. Because the reality is this whole 22 minutes of learning a week, I'm not sure how accurate that is, I know it's an average, um, but people really just don't have that much time available to them, okay? So what we wanted to look at is kind of what that means for learning designers. So I used to be head of content um, at Learning Pool before I moved into the product side. Um, and we used to work a lot with creating fairly traditional e-learning. So we had catalogs of content, we had bespoke content. Our catalogs of content, they're great. We've spent a lot of time working on them, making them kind of engaging, easy to use, quick to work through so we're not wasting people's time. I think that's really important. But fundamentally, they are 30-minute modules, okay? 30 to 60-minute modules, something around that. 
Um, and what we're doing now is where we're trying to kind of change how the platforms work, we need to start looking at the content that we create. So we are going through kind of quite a big process of transformation with our learning designers in trying to get them to think outside of a 30-minute module. So if somebody comes to you and says, I need to train people on this, your first answer isn't, I'll make you an e-learning module. Your answer might be that you can look at a learning campaign, and that's something that we're really starting to focus on. So basically, we, everyone talks about micro-learning. It's a real buzzword. People love it because we know that people don't have enough time. But the reality is, actually, there's a lot more... Um, sometimes you need more depth. So a 10-minute module isn't going to give you everything you need to know on a particular subject. So how do we get around that? How do we get around that lack of time and kind of pulling it all together? So what we've been doing um, at Learning Pool as I said, is looking at these things called learning campaigns. And this is to do with driving engagement. Again, engagement is a bit of a dirty word when it comes to learning. Lots of people that know a lot about learning say, we don't, engagement tells you nothing. And they're right, it doesn't tell you anything. But if they're not there, they're definitely not learning what you want them to learn. So just being kind of mindful of that, and it really helps. So what we think the learning designers really need, and they already have this, they just need to look at how you apply it differently, is a real understanding of how people learn. So what we mean by a learning campaign, and initially we're looking at doing this via email because it's something that everybody has. We've gone down the route of chatbots and all that kind of stuff, and eventually we will plug, plug all that in as well. Um, but actually, we just thought initially, send someone an email once a day. They'll get it, they'll see it. Ask them to do something really, really small. So we're talking like max two or three minutes. But do that over a period of time and really vary how you do that, okay? So Matt was talking earlier about our plastics campaign. That's one that we're looking at. Um, the second one that we're looking at is coaching. So we have a great 30-minute e-learning module on coaching. It's really good, but actually we just wanted to do something different and try delivering this in a different way so that we can see what people get from that. So where we've started designing this campaign, we start by um, asking people to think about what they know about coaching. So we don't tell them anything to begin with. We start in the way that you would start a coaching conversation. Talk to them, find out a bit about them, ask them about their experiences. And what you're starting to do there is to get their brain working in a different way so that they're actually considering what they want to get out of this. Um, as Matt said, you can also do some of this stuff around how confident are you, how experienced are you, and then give diff people different pathways um, through that content as well. There will always be a knowledge element. There is some pieces that you're going to want to present to people. But what we're suggesting is that you do that in very bite-sized pieces, make them small, make them really succinct and to the point. Your learners don't have much time, almost play on that. I know myself, if I get a video that's going to take me half an hour, an hour, webinars are a classic example. I rarely actually go back and watch them unless I do the live one. But you send me something that's two or three minutes, I'm all over it, that's fine. I can always find that level of time. Active recall is a really important one as well. So, and this goes round to the kind of questioning. So we want learning designers to actually get people to build this stuff into their brains, not just kind of read it, forget it. We want them to actually reconstruct it. So by active recall, we mean getting people to re-deliver back to you what they've learned, because that is how we all remember. It might be that they go off and speak to someone else that kind of that they work with or have a conversation with the person sat next to them or their line manager. Or it might be that they create a train, piece of training on it. They might create a video on it that they can then share with other the people. So there's lots of ways of doing it. Um, the nudge theory is that kind of engagement piece and about kind of if you continually do something, eventually it becomes a pattern and you will therefore continue to do it. People do it with all sorts of things in their, in their own lives. So whether it's couch to 5K, whether you're trying to eat more healthily, if you've got a sign on your fridge that says kind of remember to eat an apple before you have the chocolate or something like that. Um, so that we can do that through email. So just that regular kind of drip feeding. Space practice, I'm sure most of you know about this, and we're using um, that in our campaigns too. So don't just tell something, somebody something once and expect them to remember it. Ask them about it um, a week later, but get them to apply it. Actually get them to think about how they would use it in a particular situation. 
Um, and then the final thing that we're looking at doing with campaigns, and it, it's been an interesting one actually, because we picked coaching before I kind of made the link with the fact that actually what we're looking to do is get people to coach themselves, but supported by a system. A, a machine can't coach you. They aren't at that level yet. Whether they ever will be is probably open to debate. But what they can do is nudge you in the right direction, give you questions to think about, and try and get you kind of engaged in thinking about how you move forward. Okay. So one of the things that um, we do, that we're aware of as well, so that's obviously learning designers. Learning designers sit around designing content all day long. That's what they're submerged in. We're aware that lots of people um, are in either in L&D or working as managers of teams and need to do similar kind of levels of training. Um, so within our um, curator platform, we've got these things called learning experiences. We started off with a nice round number. We started off with 40. We keep adding to it, so I think we've now got 43. I'm sure it will continue to grow. Um, I don't know whether you can read that. It's a bit small, but it ranges from things like talk to an expert, undertake a face-to-face -face course. There is also take an e-learning course in there. There's read an article, read a book, uh, write a summary of something. Um, so we're kind of helping people go, right, okay, this is the breadth of what I can get people doing. These are the activities that help people learn. So we're not just looking at creating content. There's loads of good stuff out there already. You, often, you won't need to. It's just finding ways to get it to people. Which brings us on to curation. So one of the things we had, if you start to personalize stuff and you send people on different pathways, you could argue you're creating three, four, even five times the amount of content to cater for the different types of people that you're trying to reach. But actually, one way around that is look for curated content. There is amazing stuff out there. I'm sure all of you have kind of got TED Talks and um, articles and uh, publications are now online that you go to. You can use those. Some of them are behind paywalls, but many, many more aren't. Um, and the beauty of that is if you're using that kind of content, it does take time to find it. Um, but what that does is then frees up your budget to actually go and do a bit like Matt was talking about with the laminate the earth bit. You can then spend your budget in a very different way to how you might have done previously. Um, the other thing with curation is there's a lot of talk about kind of machine learning and kind of uh, automatic curation. And I think probably any of you that have signed up to kind of services that send you curated content on a daily basis will know that sometimes they get it right, some do it better than others. But actually, if you're looking at your team and your organization, there's probably always going to be an area for a human being doing some of that work. So in our ideal world, and we're not there with that yet, um, although you can do it in a kind of fairly manual way in that you collect them from the web, but actually getting a human being to own that and to spend an hour a day really looking for the stuff that's most useful, sorry, not an hour a day, that's probably way too much, an hour a week or an hour a month, um, looking for stuff that's really useful to a particular group within your organization, and that's a really good way of doing that. So let the computers do the hard work. So in conclusion, machines aren't coming for your jobs. Um, they might one day, but as I said, it's probably very much open for debate. Um, but what they can do is really make your life easier and help you look at very different ways to approach problems. So that's all I've got to say today. So thank you for listening. Um, if anybody's got any questions, we're happy to take them now if you would like to, or we'll be here afterwards also. Oh, and sorry, we're on stand 23. <laughs> Sales team behind me. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Okay, that's great. Thanks for listening.